Greetings in the name of our risen and resurrected Lord Jesus Christ to all who have joined this podcast service from the Pottestra Methodist Church on this Pentecost Sunday. Pentecost celebrates the birth of the Christian Church on that day long ago when the disciples of the Lord Jesus, meeting in prayer, were suddenly immersed in the power of the Holy Spirit to the glory of God. As such, today's message will look at who the Holy Spirit is and why we as Christians should be serving God in His divine power. My name is Edward Brown, and I'm a member of the pastoral staff in this church. Let us pray. Praise your wonderful name, exalted Father God. Praise you for your love and mercy that reaches out every day to touch your church and your creation. Praise you that you sent your divine Holy Spirit, the one who represents you into the world to strengthen to empower and to guide the faithful who follow and serve you. Praise your name, Holy Spirit, for you were ever present as part of the Godhead that we worship. Praise your name, for you were active prior to the creation of the universe, brooding and hovering over what would come into being under your care. Praise your name, for you have always been active in the world, empowering men and women touching lives and healing and restoring that which was damaged or broken, and even bringing back to life that which was dead. Praise you that by your divine action, somehow in the most wonderful and inexplicable way, God became incarnate as the Eternal Son, our Saviour and Lord Jesus Christ. Praise your name, Lord Jesus. Praise you that you loved us so much that you came to live among us to be our Lord Master, Saviour and Friend, praise you for teaching your followers about the Divine Holy Spirit and then in petitioning that Heavenly Father to send Him in your name on that first Pentecost day. Thank you that you continue to send your Holy Spirit to empower your followers to serve your people and this broken world. And so in celebration of God's presence among us in the form of the Holy Spirit, we join in the hymn of prayer that Jesus gave us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Our hymn for today is Reverend Charles Wesley's lovely hymn, Lord, we believe to us and ours the apostolic promise given. It is hymn 274 in the Methodist hymnal. Lord, we believe to us and ours the apostolic promise given. We wait the Pentecostal powers, the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven. To every one that God shall call, the promise is securely made. To you far off, he calls you all. Believe the word which Christ has said. The Holy Ghost, when I depart, the Comforter shall surely come, shall make the contrite sinner's heart his loved, his everlasting home. Assembled here with one accord, calmly we wait the promised grace, the purchase of our dying Lord, Come, Holy Ghost, and fill this place. If every one that asks may find, if still thou dust on sinners fall, come as a rushing mighty wind, great grace be now upon us all. Our lesson for today is found in the book of Acts. We read from chapter 2. When that day of Pentecost came, the disciples were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven 
and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard the sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, Are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in his own native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own language. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, What does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, They've had too much wine. Then Peter stood up and with the eleven raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk, as you suppose. It is only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heaven above, and signs on the earth below. Blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. May God bless the scripture to us. Amen. One of the great misunderstandings of the wider church is that God's Holy Spirit was a discovery by the Pentecostal churches about 60 years ago. Nothing could be further from the truth. God's Holy Spirit is found to be active and mentioned throughout the Bible. In fact, the first reference to him is in Genesis 1 verse 2, where we read that the Spirit of God was present and active even before creation began. That being said, it is true that the references to the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament are scant. And where they do occur, we find that the Holy Spirit active selectively to grant special abilities for special ministries to only some of the people. And so we read how Bezalel was filled with the Holy Spirit to be a master artist and craftsman in Exodus 31 verse 3. In other instances, such as in Numbers 11.25 and 1 Samuel 10 verse 10, the Holy Spirit equipped people to be prophetic leaders. The greatest of the Jewish kings, King David, was aware that he could not be the ruler that God wanted him to be unless he was empowered daily by the Holy Spirit. We read about that in Psalm 51. And in 2 Chronicles 1 verse 1, there is a record of how God's presence in the young King Solomon's life made him great. Sadly, this did not last, because unlike his father David, he did not work at keeping himself connected to that godly power, and later lost his relationship with God, as he came to rely more on his intellectual powers and less on God's Holy Spirit power to guide him. But this selective empowering was not what God had intended. And through the prophet Joel, he said, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit on those days. It's in Joel chapter 2, verse 28 and 29. This all came to pass on that first Pentecost Sunday. As God's Holy Spirit was released in power on that small band of disciples, and the church was born. Over the next few years, the church would spread throughout the Roman Empire, first as a persecuted movement, then gradually became more tolerated, and finally it was accepted 
as the official religion of the empire. Today, the church has impacted historically on every society on the earth. And the promise of God's Holy Spirit is still available to all who desire to live in accordance to God's laws and standards. Now, there is something that is very important that we must know about the interrelationships between the Godhead Trinity before we proceed any further. And that is that God cannot be separated in any way. But very simply, God Father, God Son, and God the Holy Spirit together make up an indivisible whole. The Lord Jesus in Matthew 28 verse 19 made this point about being one and indivisible when he said, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Note carefully that Jesus used the singular word name, not the plural form of names. What this means is that anyone has accepted Jesus as Savior, then that person is automatically in a relationship with the Father and the Holy Spirit. But that does not mean that the fullness of the Holy Spirit's power is at work in the person. The Christian believer must ask God to release his power into his or her life. We must pray seriously, requesting the release of the presence and power of his Holy Spirit. Christ Jesus made this quite plain to the disciples when he told them that, as flawed as they were, that he knew that they loved their children and accordingly spoiled them with gifts. And then using that as his jumping off point, he told them that the Heavenly Father was infinitely more loving and generous than they could ever be, and that their Father longed to give the gift of his Holy Spirit to anyone who asked. That's in Luke 11, 11 to 13. All people have to do is ask, and then in God's perfect Kairos time, he will grant the answer to that prayer. The founder of the Methodist Church, the Reverend John Wesley, called this the second blessing and advocated that all Methodists earnestly seek that blessing. Unfortunately, the majority of Christians never experience the blessing of God's Holy Spirit power in their lives for a number of reasons. The first is that they are impatient. They're not willing to wait prayerfully as the first disciples did. After the ascension of the Lord Jesus, the disciples returned to Jerusalem and spent the next ten days in prayerful worship. By the way, that does not mean that they prayed day and night, only that they had a prayerful and expectant attitude during this time as they went about their daily duties. And then on Pentecost, the Holy Spirit broke through to bless them and empower them. Another reason that many Christians are never blessed with the power of the Holy Spirit is because they are full of their own self-importance. Pride gets in God's way because the proud person is a self-ruler and because God never forces anyone to get off the throne of his or her own life. He will let that person run and sometimes even ruin their life. And because the self-important person doesn't answer to God, God cannot trust that person with his divine power. A third reason that many Christians never live in the power of God's Holy Spirit is because they lack faith and that they do not believe that the Holy Spirit is still active in the world. They say the time of the Holy Spirit is over. And that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy in their lives because they will never think of praying for something that they don't believe in. And God will never force his power on anyone. And finally, there are people who are scared of what will happen in their lives should God fill them with power. They know with great power comes great responsibility. And they are not prepared to do what God may require of them should they be filled with his Holy Spirit. They are happy to remain as they are, ordinary, underpowered Christians. This brings us to the question, what are the drawbacks of not being spirit-filled? The short answer is that the ordinary Christian is actually no different from the non-Christian in terms of spiritual power. There is a word that describes this type of Christian. It is carnal which means worldly. The carnal Christian's lack of spiritual power means that she or he has to rely on their own strength and resources in their daily lives. All of us face temptations of various kinds every day. The carnal Christian has a much greater chance of succumbing to that temptation. 
The carnal Christian is more easily inclined to adopt as reasonable the worldly viewpoints on issues such as the use of legalized marijuana, which is morally wrong, or to support the issue of abortion on demand, which ignores the right of the unborn to life, or to accept as normal the rise of the perverted alternatives to the biblical position of one man and one woman marriage, or may easily resort to paying of bribes to corrupt officials to get a job done. The carnal Christian is more easily disturbed by events in daily life because they have a limited understanding of God's involvement in their life and accordingly may suffer from the ailments related to stress. Lastly, the carnal Christian easily becomes religious as this is the worldly substitute for living in the power of God's Holy Spirit. It is easy to recognize such people. Their lives are like that of the Pharisees of Jesus' time. They're consisting of lists of do's and don'ts that regulate their lives. And most especially, they have no joy in their worship. I remember one such matriarchal lady in a small church I very reluctantly and thankfully only occasionally preached in many years ago. Stern, unsmiling and unyielding in her religion, she ruled her church with misery until under the ministry of a friend some time later, she and the congregation was touched by the Holy Spirit and were transformed into the true children of God. My friend told me that where before it had been a difficult chore to preach there, I agreed completely. It became a joyous pleasure to minister there. The above example of the lady in that church that Jesus turned around answers the question about whether the church is now operating on its own with a resounding no. The Lord Jesus has not abandoned his church. The experience of generations of Christians over the last 2,000 years is that we can trust the Lord Jesus. He has not changed, and all the promises that he made to the disciples are as valid today for his modern followers as they were when he made them. The power of God's Holy Spirit is available to all who truly want power. That is the power that transformed John Wesley into the preacher that many historians admit almost single-handedly saved Britain from the same kind of revolution that was to hit France, just a short boat ride across the English Channel. The Holy Spirit power turns lives around makes individuals, ministries active and successful, and leads to victorious, triumphant living. To receive that power, all that is required is that people sincerely ask. God wants to release his power into the lives of his people to transform and empower us. The Christian without the power of the Holy Spirit is like someone who would rather keep the rusty, old, underpowered wreck of a car than the top-of-the-line luxury SUV that God wants to give to them. Our Heavenly Father says, Ask, and you will receive the power to live to my glory. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious Lord God and Heavenly Father, in the name of our Lord and Saviour, your Son Jesus Christ, we ask that where we sit right now, that you pour your Holy Spirit out upon us, that we might be filled to overflowing to the glory of your name and eternal kingdom. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forever. Amen.